let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast, This Week in America. His Majesty's Airship, The Life and Tragic Death of the World's Largest Flying Machine by noted author and historian S.C. Gwynn, is a stunning historical tale of the rise and fall of the world's largest airship and the doomed love story between an ambitious British officer and a married Romanian princess at its heart. The tragic story of the British airship R-101, which went down in a spectacular hydrogen-fueled fireball in 1930, killing more people than died in the Hindenburg disaster seven years later, has been largely forgotten until now. In His Majesty's Airship, master storyteller S.C. Gwen resurrects it in vivid detail, telling the epic story of great ambition gone terribly wrong, a rich tale of technology, daring, and folly. S.C. is the author of the Hymns of the Republic and the New York Times bestsellers Rebel Yell and the Empire of the Summer Moon, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, National Book Critics Award Circle as well, spending a remarkable 82 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. His book, The Perfect Pass, American Genius, and the Reinvention of Football was published in September 2016, was named to a number of top 10 sports book lists. He was with us on This Week in America to discuss that book. S.C. spent most of his career as a journalist, including stints with Time as bureau chief, national correspondent and senior editor, and with Texas Monthly as executive editor. He lives in Austin, Texas. We welcome back to This Week in America, acclaimed author and historian S.C. Sam Gwynn, author of His Majesty's Airship, The Life and Tragic Death of the World's Largest Flying Machine. Sam, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to have you back with us. It it is an honor and a pleasure to be talking to you. What a great story that you tell here. And you make us think that we are right there as history is unfolding. We are there and actually watching this. Where did this idea come from? What inspired you to to look into the story of this British airship and the tragic fate? Well, I I, I initially encountered the idea in a, in a three volume history of the British Empire, the uh, book that um, nobody reads anymore, but it was just a couple of pages, and it just seemed like this. It was this story of, of this this incredibly ambitious uh, attempt to. Uh, called the Imperial Airship Scheme to sort of fill the skies of the British Empire with giant airships. And, with you know, it was this kind of uh, uh, empire-wide scheme that went, that went south and, 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 and somehow was all tied up in the, in the, in the decline of, of the British Empire. And I thought, well, and, and moreover, it was an airship crash, as you said. That was seven years before Hindenburg that nobody knows about anymore, but it was more lethal and a much better story. And I just, uh, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it has been, the people have been forgotten, the crash has been forgotten, and uh, I'm reviving it. Well, you are, and doing so well. The book by S.C. Gwynn is His Majesty's Airship. We'll give you information. Book available basically wherever books are sold. And I love on Sam's website, which is scgwynn.com. You can click on Indie and find an independent bookstore in your area to purchase the book there. And we'll have all of this as, as we go through the conversation today. Talk about once you get this knowledge, like this sounds like a really interesting story. Well, then you have to go and and do the research. What was the research like for His Majesty's airship and the sources you relied upon? And were you surprised as you were looking into this? Yeah, it was. uh, So the the sources, uh, most of the source material, unfortunately, it's voluminous, uh, is in the United Kingdom National Archives. That is in London. Uh, in a little place called Kew, about seven miles southwest of the center of London. And, uh, you know, the United Kingdom archives, that's where they have, uh, you know, King Arthur's pipe and slippers, you know, Robin Hood's tights. Oh, you know, yes. so, I mean, li- literally stuff going back to <laughs> Roman times, though, and huge scrolls. And it's a wonderful place to go research. But I, I had some trouble early in COVID getting there because, you know, COVID closed all libraries, collections, museums, everything, which are my bread and butter. So there was a period of time when I did some very aggressive workarounds trying to fix that. But I eventually got there, spent time in the archives, went to the RAF Museum, you know, which was great. And uh, and uh, and some of the other museums and uh, and collections and libraries in England. And that was great. Went to a, a wonderful private archive up in Blackpool in the northwest shore. Anyway, I had I had a great month in England out of the deal. And that was that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I think that. 
you know what 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 I what I'm writing about in the book as much as anything here is is human folly. I mean, yes. airships were invented in 1900 by Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. We will know the name Zeppelin, right? And not just from the musical band, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, and they ended in 1939. And the reason was they were fundamentally flawed. Not that airplanes didn't crash all the time too. Then they did, except that airplanes were fundamentally a good idea. And as time went by, they 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 dominated. But there was a long time when people thought, you know, airships were going to be the, the long range travel of the future. They seemed to make more sense. Planes were noisy and dangerous and required constant fueling. And so there's this kind of moment that I'm writing about in the early century that airplanes and airships and we're talking about rigid airships, giant, you know, five, six, seven hundred foot long things full of hydrogen, which was incredibly dangerous. Yes. Um, you know, which which was this these technologies that that existed in the early century. You know, it, it's fascinating. You got a chapter in that. It's a short one, they, well, and it's called "The Brief History of a Bad Idea." And you would think after you read that chapter that nobody would try it again, and they did try it again with disastrous results. The book is "His Majesty's Airship: The Life and Tragic Death of the World's Largest Flying Machine" by S. C. Gwynn, G. W. Y. N. N. E. His website S. C. Gwynn dot com. All of this information on our website this week in America. Uh, dot us let's talk about the cast of characters you have several that are fascinating and flawed at, at various levels talk about the characters because they really make this story come alive yeah it's full of great characters yes. and uh it's uh you know the, the chief character is this guy named lord christopher birdwood thompson and he um he is the uh, was the Secretary of State for Air, which is a great title, I think. And he was, as such, in England, in post-war England, he was the guy that drove this, it was called the Imperial Airship Scheme. And I'll give you a little background on it. Coming out of World War I, um, the uh, Great Britain held the, it was already a pretty big empire back in the 19th century. But after World War I, it inherited the parts, big parts of the Ottoman Empire, the German Empire, it, after the war, the, the British held the greatest, the largest empire the world had ever known, 25% of the globe. And uh, a lot of it just connected. I mean, it was an, it was an extremely large expanse of real estate. And and uh, and yet and yet there were cracks in it. You know, you had the Boer War and you had the Irish Rebellion and you had this India was seething. And we know what's going to happen with India eventually. And all these things were happening. And so in the 20s, sort of men of empire looking for some new way to understand their far flung empire, to strengthen it, to make it more powerful. They didn't have the military option they did before, but they came upon this idea that they would link this vast space together with these giant airships and uh, which still at that point seemed like a plausible way to go, uh, that they would be better for that than airplanes would. And so Christopher Birdwood Thompson, Lord Thompson, who would five generations of the Raj in India, enormously influential military family. He came from there, was born in India. He fought in most of the, the uh, theaters of uh, war of the, uh, for England uh, in, in the 19, uh, early 19th century, early 20th century, early 1900s. And he, it was his, he was the driving force behind this idea, this scheme, this scheme, and it was going to, we're going to be, Airships literally floating through the skies of empire, yes. and they and not only that, it was going to be British technology. You know, if you go back to the 19th century, you can understand part of or a big part of British dominance. Uh, they ruled the waves, right? Why? Because they they were the masters of the pounding piston. You know, the built guns bigger than anybody else, and ships bigger, and engines bigger, and these guys it was just based on this sort of technology. And so, Britain was going to rule this new world, a, a peaceful world through the air with their own technology. And this was the, the incredibly ambitious and doomed, um, as was Thompson himself, doomed uh, ambition called the Imperial Airship Scheme. With us on This Week in America, S.C. Gwynn. He's the author of the new book, His Majesty's Airship, The Life and Tragic Death, the World's Largest Flying Machine. You talk in the book about the technical limitations, the, the fatal flaws of these airships. Talk about overlooking that and thinking they could conquer all of those and, and going ahead with this project. Yes, it's a, it's an early, you know, airship technology was in its infancy in, in the early 1900s, as were airplanes. They were competing. 
there was at one point where the, the German Zeppelins could stay aloft, you know, for, for 12 hours at a time when the Wright brothers, and carried 12 or eight or 12 people aloft while the Wright brothers were carrying one person aloft and did doing 38 minutes. So there, you know, there was this, uh, these, these, these competing technologies, but as, as, as the decades move forward, airplanes got better and better and airships did not. And there was some, they had some real problems starting with hydrogen. They were filled with hydrogen, hydrogen. If you touch a spark to it goes boom. Everybody's seen that, that film of the Hindenburg. Yes. Um, that's what it looks like when it happens. Now you think, well, maybe that was the, people may think no, but that was the only time that that happened. There were about 70 of those, most of them German Zeppelins during the war, but also uh, you know, American airships and, and Italian airships and French airships and British airships going up this way. So you had this huge flaw, hydrogen, anything touches it at all in the way of a spark, um, which was, of course, learned by the British fighter pilots in World War One, shooting down Zeppelin bombers over London. They figured out all you got to do is hit one with a, an incendiary bullet and it goes up in a very satisfying video game like <laughs> yes. way. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, and but. But if that wasn't the only flaw, though, if you take our, the, the hero airship of my book is the R101, which was at the time it flew the largest thing that had ever flown. It was 777 feet long, bigger than the Titanic by volume. It was really something. And uh, but it also had six acres of surface area, this doped cloth that covered the steel frame up there. You know, just think of what the Hindenburg looks like. And you got six acres and if you've ever been in a little sailboat like a sunfish, when a 20 mile an hour wind hits it, I mean, imagine what six acres does when you hit it with a 50 mile an hour wind. Oh, yes. They were enormously vulnerable to wind. They could not land in a storm because they would be beaten to death on the ground and then usually would blow up in a hydrogen fireball. Um, they were just they were they were extremely difficult to fly, difficult to navigate, subject to all kinds of things, temperature of the air, density of the air, humidity in the air. Uh, they were a very flawed idea. And, uh, and as I said, airplanes were in the early going, too, but those got better and better over the years. The, the airships never really solved them. And so when we look back at the era, we can say it started in 1900, ended in 1939, and that was it. Uh, and it's kind of a miracle that it went on for so long. And that, and that, you know, in the early days of any technology, there's a, you know, there's, you can see it in hindsight, maybe, but at the time, you don't, there, people uh, are optimistic. They think it's going to work. You know, I mean, I personally wouldn't have gotten into an airplane in 1912, but there were people who would. Yeah. <laughs> there were p always people who were going to push forward, you know, with new technology, people who were brave, optimistic. And this drove a lot, this drove the airship industry for as long as it lasted. When you see the illustrations, the drawings, the layout, the luxury that people would be traveling in the airships, it would be rather tempting to think, okay, I could travel and that would be a pretty nice way to go, that it really was a sight to behold, wasn't it? It was. It was not only big, but it was it, it was meant to be luxurious yes. and meant to offer this, you know, airplanes... It was a, a flight from somebody made in 1927 or 28 from London to Karachi in India. And it was 12 bone rattling days, you know, 26 stops uh, for fuel, just a really difficult, arduous task. An airship can make it in two days with one stop. And so the vision of these things was they were going to be luxurious. They were going to look like an ocean liner. And R101 did. Have an asbestos lined smoking lounge, which is interesting in a in an airship with five point five <laughs> yeah, million cubic. I had to read that hydrogen. twice to make sure I understood that correctly. <laughs> it had it, had, you know, it, it was meant to it had a promenade, so you could look down as you floated serenely at, at an altitude of fifteen hundred feet, seeing deer run through the forests. I mean, and you know, while you were being served a mint julep or something, this was this was this grand vision of travel. It was going to be nice and luxurious and. Um, it was not going to involve what it actually ended up involving, by and large, which is death and fireballs and crashes. Yeah, you get on board, you wouldn't expect an ashtray. It just seemed a little out of place there. But it's uh, <laughs> it's such a compelling story. Our guest on the program is S.C. Gwynn, G-W-Y-N-N-E, -N -N -E, author of His Majesty's Airship. His website is scgwynn.com, book available, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, independent bookstores all across the country. Back with uh, S.C. Gwynn after these messages. Stay tuned. Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. 
for listening to This Week in America. Our guest on the program today is S.C. Gwynn, author of the book, His Majesty's Airship. Let's talk a little bit about what happened on that day. The day, well, let's lead up to that, because they, they had, what, a forerunner of the R-101, what had a tragic failure, a big explosion, knocked people down on the ground. Talk about that. The, the fact that they could have a problem wasn't a real surprise to them, was it? No, as I said, there have been, so, there have been many German crashes. The Germans invented these things, the big rigid airships, uh, many crashes, before World War I, us all kinds of crashes during World War I, which where the Germans were launching Zeppelins and, uh, as bombers against seven, seven different cities in, uh, in Europe. So there, there were all these, there was, there were, there were if, you, if you look back on it, you can see there were mainly crashes. It was an exception when they didn't, they didn't crash. So in 1921, uh, 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 it was the British first attempt coming out of the war the Germans led the world in technology. Everybody was years behind them. But after the war, they were for the Treaty of Versailles, where they were forbidden to build these things. So the British jump in now, and they're going to do the Germans one better. And um, they build this ship called the R-38, which is meant to be the kind of perfected Zeppelin, actually goes up at a giant hydrogen fireball and kills a whole generation of of uh, the airship establishment in Britain. And, and if you look at these years, you know, an American airship Shenandoah goes down, the American airship Roma, the French airship Desmude, there's just crash, 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 crash. And, and it was this kind of vaulting ambition of Lord Thompson and his, and his fellows there to create uh, a new technology that would basically, uh, you know, it, it, rings, it rings like the Titanic. They were going to make this thing as safe as a house, as they said. It was going to be unsinkable, yeah. not unsinkable. It was going to be uncrashable like the Titanic. And there was, and I paint a picture of complete disaster. It was, there, were, there were moments of glory here, and I'll tell you about one, because it's one of the characters in the book named uh, Herbert Scott. And Herbert Scott they, British after the war found themselves with a Zeppelin that they or an airship that they had modeled from stolen basically from German Zeppelins that had no business flying across the Atlantic. But this guy Herbert Scott flew it across the Atlantic, first east to west crossing ever, turned around and flew it back, first double crossing of the Atlantic eight years before Lindbergh. There were at least ten times when the thing should have gone down. It was an act of incredible heroism. He was the greatest hero in the world at that point in 1919. Um, a hero of aviation. And again, he's lost to history. He was the guy on R101 when it departed for India that fateful night in October of 1930 that gave the no go, no go call into the storm. And he had by that point be, had become a drunk. Anyway, there's lots of interesting characters here. He's one of them. Um, and uh, and and yes, there was so much precedent for bad luck and and bad results here that. It's it's truly a wonder to me still that they that they pushed off on their, you know, ten thousand mile round trip journey that night. Why did they? In reading, Thompson seems like a decent guy, naive, received a lot of bad information, and had a tight schedule, didn't he? Part of this whole imperial airship scheme that you had talked about. Yes, he did. It was it was rushed. I mean, he wanted he. He literally, he wanted to, this is our, our Lord Thompson here, the guy running, what he wanted to do was, this is the, again, the Imperial Airship Scheme. In order to do what he wants to do, he's got to demonstrate it can be done. So he's going to take this R-101, the largest thing that's ever flown. They're going to leave. They're going to fly it to India two days down, turn around and fly it back. And, uh, and, <clears throat> and he's going to, literally, this was his plan. He was going to get off the airship trailing clouds of glory motor his way into london where the imperial conference was taking place and show up on the dais and introduce the world to this new idea of air of of uh, airships uh, in the british empire yes. dominating the skies and that was his plan and so it was rushed rushed in order to get there to get back for the for the imperial conference that was rushed they never put it through the trials they should have they didn't pay attention to their inspectors who talked about these incredibly fragile 10-story gas bags made out of cattle intestines or the exterior cloth that was just doped cloth that you could put your finger through. I mean, there were all sorts of, yeah, it was an enormously fragile thing uh, in addition to being sort of a strong thing in some ways. But uh, 
anyway, this is this is the process. This was the process of getting that thing to take off on October fourth. And, and as I say, it's still amazing that they tried, but they never made it. They made it about seven and a half hours, crossed the channel, and went down in a fireball that was just like the Hindenburgs um, that in the early morning hours. Um, you know, it's in interesting. France. You do a a breakdown, basically minute by minute, of the uh, of the flight and what went wrong. Was there any particular uh, issue or just a, a compilation of things that worked against it? Well, the the uh, yeah, I, I, the book is sort of written where you're, there's every other chapter you're on you're on the boat. I mean, yes. you're, I'm sorry, you're not the boat, the airship the boat, the Lusitania, it's as though you're on the Lusitania because you know what's going to happen, but you're, you're on board the ship as it is heading on its seven hour flight toward its, um, toward its doom. But yes, there was the, 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 the reason, the main reason it went down is because, you know, I won't give all the details is because the two most fragile pieces of it, the cover and the gas bags that were again, made from cattle intestines. That sounds really unusual, but that's what it was. Yes. Failed. Um, and these things, these things had already failed before. They knew that they had failed, and a lot of that was suppressed. So there's a certain amount of incompetence. I mean, it's sort of a mixture in some ways of just unjustified optimism and incompetence. And if you call incompetence not paying attention to your chief inspector who says, don't do that. You know, it's such an amazing story. A couple of minutes left with S.C. Gwynn, author of the book, is Majesty's Airship, The Life and Tragic Death of the World's Largest Flying Machine. Uh, it was a few years later, you had the uh, the Hindenburg, and we all know about that, but rarely does anyone know about His Majesty's Airship that, you, that you've that you written about that. Why is that, do you think? It, it, the fact that it was British and this was a, a disaster here in the United States? There was a little bit of that, I think, at least as far as the United States goes. But I think it's been largely a lot of it's been forgotten in Britain, too, which is very interesting, considering it was a huge national tragedy and and overflow crowds of, you know, St. Paul's and Westminster cathedrals and a million people in the streets of Whitehall to watch the funeral cortege go by. It was an enormous tragedy for the nation. Um, and so why is it forgotten? There's a couple of reasons. One, I think the Hindenburg, which is the only time ever anyone ever had on film what a an airship a rigid airship looked like oh, when it yes. went up in a fireball i mean that thing that that film that silent film was was shown in movie theaters all over the world it was the first great reality tv you know and uh um they, it was married later to sound uh, or married with sound by a british producer in the 1960s and then you had not only the 30 seconds of the incredible fireball but you had the voice going oh the humanity and so everybody knows about it. And I think to some extent, the Hindenburg kind of overwrote what happened before. I mean, to me, the Hindenburg is not as good a story. The main story about the Hindenburg is what made it go boom. Uh, R101, uh, to me, is a, well, killed more people, but far better story. Um, it, was, it was a story of kind of the decline of the British Empire. But um, I think to some extent, too, you know, the airship era, era ended in 1939 forever these that, that this these this technology had a 40-year life and then it ended and i think just the very fact that it went out of all i mean while airplanes went on to dominate the world yeah these things kind of just faded from memory except you know you may see the goodyear blimp or the fuji blimp over a sporting event. Oh, yes. those aren't airships those aren't i'm sorry they are they're, they're not rigid airships they're um, they're blimps. They're they're essentially envelopes filled with gas with with maybe a rigid keel, but they're they're not. They're much smaller than those the giants that that roamed the earth in the early century. What did we learn from R101? Did it have any impact on aviation industry, the aviation future advancements, as well as safety measures? There was a lot of things that they did uh, in the that I won't go through now in the way of material science. Uh, you know, science, you know, uh, alloy science, you know, there were pumps, electrical, systems, all sorts of things that were innovative and, and, and did continue. But the crash of the R101 killed the British um, airship industry dead. Just not, that was it. It never went beyond that at all and should have killed it, I think, globally, except the Americans had to have two more crashes after that. And then then another crash that the Germans had to have the crash of the Hindenburg after that. And even then it didn't, the Germans still had one ship going, but it mostly just killed 
um, the, I was just basically just killed the airship industry. Yes. And it, that's what it did. And there wasn't any, I mean, there were other lessons. It's like, you know, pay less, more attention to your technology and less attention to nationalism and to national pride. <laughs> too. Yes. Um, because to some extent, these big ships were all, all wrapped up in national pride. They were very huge national kind of kind of hubris attached to them. They were so big and they were so technologically sophisticated and, and they didn't look like anything before. And there was this sense of national pride, first in Germany and then in the United States and, uh, and Great Britain. And you capture that, what uh, this emotion that was running through the, the people there, the pride they were taking and what they were, what they were seeing un- unfolding. Just to wrap up here, I'm looking online a few days ago, and I see this headline, The Second Age of Airships. Uh, designed for freight, not passengers. Cardington, England, which plays a role in His Majesty's airship, is apparently their major they're, role. Yeah, that they're building there, and they hope to have uh, some up and flying by by twenty twenty five. Is it viable today? Uh, you know, the, the big ridges, the, the ones, the hydrogen filled big ridges will never fly again. Um, and I actually don't think a, a big ridge, meaning a, a huge steel or aluminum, you know, uh, skeleton yes. with gas bags inside of it, we'll never see that again. They're impractical. You can't, you can't land in a storm and they're, they're too subject to wind. But some of these new, these are smaller, these yes. blimps, they're filled with helium uh, which is not the panacea. American airships all uh, had helium in them all crashed. But, um, but yeah, there, there's some really interesting ideas. There's one called the Airlander that I just love. It's very aerodynamic. It's less subject to wind. It's, again, much smaller than these airships that we're talking about. But, you know, one of them, if somebody's got an idea to charge half a million bucks and put people on the North Pole for fun you know, <laughs> tourists, which is great. There's some other things that, you know, where you can, where you can supply refugee camps and bring supplies in. And um, I mean, we can look up and, you know, you can see the Goodyear blimp and uh, up there and, uh, you know, at Wembley or, or, or at, uh, or wherever they are, I'm sorry, at, uh, you know, uh, Yankee stadium or yes. something. You, you can fly a, a blimp uh, and uh, you cannot fly it in, in bad weather and you cannot fly it in a big wind and you cannot land it in a big wind, but, but there are applications for it, I think, and I think I like the tourist one. So if I ever have a half a million bucks, you know, I'm extra <laughs> lying around. You know, I'm going to get on one of those things and go to the North Pole. That would be a nice trip to take. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Sam S.C. <laughs> Gwent is our guest on the program. G-Y-G-W-Y-N-N-E, uh, if you're Googling, uh, his website, scgwen.com. Book available at Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. Click and you'll find uh, an independent bookstore in your neighborhood that you can order the book there as well. And the book is His Majesty's Airship, The Life and Tragic Death of the World's Largest Flying Machine. Sam, it is always a pleasure to have you on the program. Another eight years. Let's do this again. Thank you for being with Absolutely. us on the program. It- Yeah, Rick, it was a great talk. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Our guest on the program is S.C. Gwynn. Again, the book, His Majesty's Airship, information available on our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and Sam's website, scgwynn.com. More on This Week in America right after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.